Dry Times Talks is a podcast from Australian Red Cross, taking you into regional Australia, where you'll hear from people all around the country, from those living on the land and from those beyond the farm gate. Our local business owners, school workers, community supporters and service providers will be sharing their stories and tips on living throughout and other tough times. There's a lot of talk about we're all on the same boat. And unfortunately, to, to consider someone's situation is different to ours, and I think that goes a long, long way in terms of creating that connection and support. You'll also hear from experts in the fields of drought resilience, health and well-being, with decades of practical experience supporting communities. So what we typically see in a drought cycle is that as soon as any rain comes, there stops being a lot of attention to drought, even though for most people in most drought regions, you won't be out of drought yet. And even when you are officially out of drought, that doesn't mean the impacts of drought stop. So one thing we need to do to help people through that post-drought stage is to encourage people to be able to feel like they can talk about that openly. Across five episodes, you'll hear how Australians are getting through and adapting to dry times and gain knowledge for how to support yourself, your loved ones, and your community. The first Christmas we were here, we couldn't get to our families, and we had four different people tell us we had to spend Christmas with them. So you're spoilt for choice when it comes to help. But I think having someone reach out to you, it makes you feel as though it's okay for you to reach out as well, which is just, it's such a nice feeling to know that you have something to offer that can actually help someone out. Subscribe to Dry Times Talks on your favourite podcast app and share it with your friends and family or go to redcross.org.au forward slash dry times for episodes and resources. Thank you, Andrew. and Thank you, Red Cross. Uh, welcome to the North Queensland Agriculture Industry Support Network. My name is Kerry Battersby and I'm Project Manager at QFF, Queensland Farmers Federation. Today, we are delighted to join with the Australian Red Cross to present their highly regarded Support the Supporters workshop. Now, you'll notice that this session is being recorded. There's the privacy policy on MS Teams. Um, so if, if you do have any issues with um, this session being recorded, um, please read that privacy policy or um, let us know in the chat or by raising your hand. Provision of this workshop is funded through the Australian and Queensland Government Disaster Funding Arrangements 2018 and administered by the Department of Communities, Disability Services and Seniors as part of the Category C Far North Queensland and North Queensland Monsoon Trough Flexible Funding Grant. This presentation is designed for anyone, farmers, recovery officers, rural financial counsellors who have been supporting primary producers to recover from the monsoon trough flood event that impacted North Queensland in January and February 2019. Now, yes, it sounds like a long time ago, January 2019, but as we know, recovery of farm production and our own well-being is continuing. Yes, North Queensland is in a tropical zone and we are tough in the north, but this monsoon season was so different to the normal cyclone season that we usually expect. The impact on community was horrific and while we can't, paradoxically, we don't want to be forgotten. This session is specifically aimed to support farmers and to this end we are delighted to include the team from GROCOM, Eilish Walker who's working on the Hort 360 team with in Bowen and also Jamie Thornbury. And we have Lena Nudz. Uh, Jamie's going to help monitor the chat. So if you've got comments to make, suggestions, anything <coughs> like that, please feel free to use the chat um, icon in the top of the screen. So thanks to GrowCom for participating in this. Now I'd like to introduce Dave Brown, Queensland Drought Coordinator with the Emergency Services Division at Australian Red Cross. Dave, over to you. Thank you, Kerry. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd uh, like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians on the lands we meet. Kerry and I are in Brisbane on the lands of the Terrible and Jagoras people, but I know we have online people from North Queensland, Western Queensland, down to Victoria. I pay my respect to all elders past, present and emerging. 
We've been receiving huge amounts of rain in some parts of Queensland over the past week, resulting in floods in some areas. But at times we have received too little rain, resulting in drought and bushfires. We at Red Cross support individuals and communities before, during and after disasters. This training is an example of that, but Red Cross also has a lot of resources that you can tap into at your own leisure that can be accessed from the Red Cross website. Two resources that I think you'll find really useful that have been developed by our drought program are our Dry Time Talk podcast series that you might have just heard a little bit in the intro. The other one is our drought and wellbeing webinars. Both share valuable insights of how we can better support our communities during tough times. However, today we have Andrew Bricks. Andrew is advisor for drought and bushfire recovery with Red Cross Victoria and is based in East Gippsland. Andrew has been delivering similar training trainings in his communities and we are really fortunate to have him with us today. I'll hand you over to Andrew. Thanks for the introduction, Dave, and thanks, um, Kerry, for the invitation to come along and speak. Um, as, uh, as Dave mentioned, my name is Andrew Brick. Uh, I've been the advisor for drought and bushfire recovery here in Victoria uh, only since about November uh, 2019. I started as a drought uh, project coordinator uh, like Dave, uh, but the fires that impacted uh, the east of the state um, could sort of quickly saw me move into a, a new role of uh, fire recovery uh, as well. And so, um, yeah, so today uh, we'll go through um, what we call this supporting the supporters uh, session. So it's pretty much a, a self-care wellbeing type session. We'll talk a little bit about stress and uh, how to identify it and then some techniques on how to uh, overcome it uh, if you can. Um, you might uh, have also you might have also heard uh, Kerry and or Dave refer to me as Bricky. Uh, I did 24 years in Victoria Police and I still think there are people there who didn't know my first name i was just uh, i was always called by my nickname so um if you do have any questions happy fear to uh you know yell out hey bricky or you know address me that in the chat that's all uh that's all good um moving right along i'm on the bunurong country uh, down here in um south gippsland so i'm actually not far from wilson's prom um it has been um comparatively uh, for us quite a dry summer uh, except today uh, it has uh, started raining and we're going to uh, cop the tail end of that uh, big system that's been pushing uh, down the east coast of Australia so whilst we haven't had the, fortunately the torrential rain that uh, some other parts have had uh, it's still uh, very welcome down here. A um, little bit of housekeeping I think um, Kerry might have mentioned um, you know we'll have a, a, a short break, a little intermission prior to uh, Eilish from Grocom uh, giving a presentation. So that'll be about, roughly about halfway through uh, the session tonight. Um, most of you will be uh, in a place that's uh, familiar um, to yourselves already. So um, you know, I hope uh, you all know where your smoke alarms are and your evacuation points and, and where, to get a, where to get a feed or, or a drink. Uh, and certainly, by all means, um, you know, jump up, stretch if you need to, um, sitting in front of the computers, as we have been uh, for quite some time now with uh, the COVID response. It um, uh, can get pretty tiring and then um, you know, your muscles start to seize up. Well, they certainly do for me because I'm not as young as I used to be. Um, some of the objectives today, I, I should probably point out too that there might be the odd dad joke uh, thrown in as well. Um, that's uh, just the way I sort of roll, and um, certainly after, as I said, all that time in uh, in the police force, I sort of sometimes I've got to make myself laugh because otherwise uh, it just gets a little bit too serious. Um, some of the objectives from today, uh, yeah. So we're going to have a look at um, understanding what some of your reactions to stress can be, and I'm sure that um, you'll all have your own um, feelings, your own knowledge uh, in how you relate. Uh, and react to stress, uh, and we'll ask for some of those, um, yeah, some input uh, when that uh, when we talk about that. Um, try and uh, we'll try and give you some of that time and space to reflect on your own well-being as well. So we have a look at, um, yeah, some of those tools uh, and tips to be able to work into your day uh, to have a look at your own well-being and just make sure that you are staying on top of things. 
so that you can make some of your critical decisions, um, not only in your personal life, but um, just as importantly at times in your business life as well. And that's where uh, Eilish from Growcom will be able to um, be able to come in and have a little bit of a chat about some of those technical decisions uh, that uh, that may need to be made um, as you're going through recovery. <clears throat> Um, introductions. I've sort of given uh, my little uh, my little spiel. Um, as I said, I'm sort of down here in um, in Victoria. I've uh, lived in Victoria all my life. Um, love uh, I love working out in the country areas. Um, it's uh, been great. I've worked um, country areas in the police force. Um, I was uh, in Diamond Creek, a little town just outside of uh, Melbourne. Uh, when the Black Saturday fires came through, that was uh, probably the the greatest introduction I'd had to emergency management, and I've been uh, pretty heavily involved in emergency management since. And I actually also chair the Gippsland uh, Regional Emergency Management Planning Committee, so the multi-agency committee that look after planning for emergency management here in Gippsland. Now, um, we might just go around the room, and it looks like we do have quite a few people on tonight, Kerry. Um, and just like uh, on Thursday, I might start with you. Um, Kerry, if we just uh, sort of go through, just perhaps just say your name and uh, and where you are or where you're from. Yep, so my name's Kerry Battersby. I'm Project Manager at Queensland Farmers Federation. I also am Industry Resilience Manager at Nursery and Garden Industry, uh, Queensland. Um, today I'm based at home in uh, the beautiful but wet and soggy Lockyer Valley. So um, enjoying the rain, and I hear there's a few um, few concerns about flooded roads. So we'll see how we go overnight. I don't think it's we've had as much rain as some of the coastal areas, but um, yeah, we'll we'll see how we go. So it's always all, all about recovery and um, having farmers support farmers and everyone who's in that industry support network um supporting thanks ricky i might if you're if you're happy i'll just um coordinate alphabetically by first name who's who's yeah. online thanks Kerry. brian dodson did you yeah say? brian dodson rural financial councillor uh based in charleville in southwest queensland and eilish yep Eilish Walker here from Growcom, uh, based in beautiful Bowen at the moment. We haven't been getting as much rain, so <laughs> it's uh, nice and dry and sunny here. Fantastic. Thanks, Eilish. Uh, Glenn. Yeah, I'm a Rural Financial Councillor, uh, currently based up in Richmond in North Queensland. I uh, was put up here temporarily uh, for the Northwest Flood uh, uh, event from 2019. Thank and you. Yeah. And Hillary. Uh, Hillary Weed, and I'm a rural financial councillor based in the uh, Western Darling Downs uh, Regional Council area in Queensland. Thanks for joining us, um, Jamie. Jamie Thornbury. Uh, Jamie Thornbury from Growcom. I'm based up in Townsville, and I run the Agrolone program building courses in disaster resilience. Thanks, Jamie. And Christy. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Christy Lambert. I'm the um, TRAIC nurse, the Tackling Regional Adversity Through Integrated Care Mental Health Nurse. Um, it's a program with Queensland Health. I'm based in Warwick. Um, we're pretty flooded at the moment. <laughs> So um, I'm just trying to get out of the office and continue this conference um, at home. So, um, yeah, so hi, everyone. Okay, we'll drive Christy and, um, yeah, let, well when you get back home, type in the chat and let us know you're, you're okay. Yes, we'll do, yeah. Thanks. Lena. Yeah, hi, everyone. Lena Knotson here from Growcom. As you can see behind me, I'm based in the Glasshouse Mountains. I do water quality, climate resilience, and natural disaster recovery for Grocom. Thanks, Lena. Okay, and you can always use the chat function if you want to tell us more about your situation as, as we go through. Thanks, Andrew. I'll hand it back to you. Thanks. Thanks, Kerry. Um, and thanks, everyone, for uh, for joining us. At, um, well, we've got uh, quite a few uh, 
real financial counselling service people here. Uh, I do a, a bit of work with the RFCS down here in um, Gippsland as well, and it's uh, it's such a wonderful service that you do provide uh, to people in the agricultural and horticultural industries um, down this way. So thanks um, thanks for your efforts uh, right across uh, Queensland uh, in relation to your work up there. Um, I probably uh, it would might be a little remiss of me if I didn't sort of give a quick. Um, little safety message obviously with all the rain um, that is falling around the place and particularly up your way um, this naturally comes second uh, if you need to uh, if you need to get out to uh, to do something uh, to keep uh, yourself or your family uh, or work colleagues safe by all means um, make sure that's uh, your, your first priority um, this is getting recorded so that uh, yeah, you can pick it up later um, Beautiful, those introductions. Thanks for that. And I guess um, I might have uh, given a, a little bit of this away uh, just with that last comment that I made about safety. But why do you think your well-being is important? So, and again, feel free to unmute and, and say something or stick something in the chat. <clears throat> why, why would your well-being be important? Kerry's typing. I've actually put my hand up. Um, I, have I suppose if uh, we're not coping very well, we're not able to uh, support our clients properly. Perfect. Yeah, that's 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 great, Brian. I think, like Brian said, if you're not uh, looking after yourself, and you know, you, you lose that capacity to uh, be able to help others, <clears throat> and of course, you know, the number one thing is that you are important, and I think, uh, and certainly. As, um, as as many people on here uh, would know, uh, particularly with dealing with a lot of people that are going through significant amounts of stress. Um, and I think, um, Linda, um, in your position at Outback Futures, uh, probably really so. It's, um, you know, it's important that we do uh, reinforce this with people, uh, particularly when they are going through some significantly challenging times for their own mental health. Is it, is it they're important? Um, yeah, and likewise, you are important because you're there to assist them. Naturally enough, you need to uh, look after yourself so that you do fill your glass. Um, and if you're keeping yourself well, as Brian said, you can go out and help others. Um, it certainly helps uh, work, definitely helps our family uh, and relationships uh, as you're moving through your day to day activities. Um, as we're going through, uh, today's session. I'll, I'll refer to um, a few uh, jobs uh, that I ran whilst I was at uh, Victoria Police. Uh, one was a, um, a long-term protest action. Um, part of the, uh, we had, had a tunnel that was going to get built under the city known as the East-West Link Tunnel. Uh, we had uh, some houses uh, in one of the inner suburbs uh, of Collingwood uh, where I was the senior sergeant. <clears throat> they had been earmarked for demolition and uh, the project didn't go ahead. These houses sat empty and the Homeless Persons Union of Victoria came and occupied those houses um, and started uh, basically using them uh, as their own um, with the very noble cause, I might add, of, uh, of providing shelter for homeless people. Uh, but of course, it, uh, it turned into a significant um, protest action uh, because the government um, had different ideas about how they would uh, use those particular houses. Um, that was a, um, a situation that lasted about six months uh, that I was in charge of and had uh, various pressures uh, from all over the place. And we'll, we'll talk about those um, shortly. Um, and then I went from Collingwood to Richmond Police Station right when they were opening up uh, or had announced a supervised injecting facility uh, to go in at the North Richmond uh, Community Health, which is, again is another inner suburban um, suburb of Melbourne. Uh, this facility was, um, uh, I guess, modelled on the facility at uh, Kings Cross. Um, if uh, people are familiar with that uh, one that's been open for about uh, 12 or so years now. And uh, again, significant, um, significant pressures um, and stresses that came that way in managing that. So um, I will refer back to them just to give it uh, just to give it a bit of a personal touch because it, uh, as um, I think maybe most people would uh, recognise, pollution is um, a stressful industry, but it's uh, no um, no more or less 
stressful than some of your industries um, because whilst uh, mine was relating mainly to dealing with people, which we do have some control over, a lot of the stresses that come in the agricultural and uh, horticultural industry are based on natural events that we have um, little control over. <clears throat> So, um, so we'll just sort of go through, and that's how that's how I'll relate to some of these stories as we're going through. So the first thing we need to do is just understand what stress is, and you will see pictures of dogs going through this because uh, the um, the Red Cross people who put this actual package together, uh, like me, love dogs, and uh, and I hope uh, a lot of you do as well. Um, some of the reactions to stress. We've got a circle here, and it's it's no coincidence that this is um, put up, or the graphic is put up as a circle, because they are these are all interlinked uh, in some way. But do um, we might as well start? Just does anyone want to sort of um, give us a, a little bit of insight into what you think that a reaction to stress might be? And I'm sure it's going to fit into uh, into one of these six categories. Yeah, thanks, uh, Kerry. Anxiety, sweaty armpits. Yep. So that's not just the humidity up uh, up there. So all of the circle. Yep, absolutely. Well, yeah, that's right. That's um, the, the stress will fit into all of those, all of those parts. I mean, you know, from a from a physical aspect, yes, there is the the sweaty armpits, potentially rashes. Um, behavioural can come out as um, either being short of temper, um, being uh, snappy uh, with people. Um, potentially really withdrawing um, into yourself and, and not really you know associating with too many people at all, becoming forgetful um, as part of that cognitive mental type uh, reaction, um, not uh, not engaging with other people like you uh, perhaps you would normal um, is a you know a, just a very short example of a social uh, reaction to stress that emotional reaction um, you know. It, could come out as um, as anger. It could come out as um, bursting into tears. Um, and I know it certainly um, occurred to me, in in me uh, as well. I can I can very much vouch for that. Um, into that um, spiritual and exi existential. It, it's a hard word to say. Spiritual and existential uh, reaction to sort of, yeah, that questioning. You know what's what what's it all worth? Why are we here? And um, so you can see that they're all, you know, they're all linked. Yeah, you know, some of that um, behavioural, um, the behavioural uh, signs are very, you know, intrinsically linked with that emotional and social part. Um, it physical because um, it's linked with that cognitive and mental, and it's it sort of goes around in that circle. So it's so it's important to uh, to understand that there are many many different uh, reactions to stress. Um, yeah, Vicky, accidents happen. Um, accidents do happen. Um, and trying to uh, sometimes understand that just, be, you know, they do. Um, you know, sometimes we don't have control over those things. Um, how many people here might have, you know, done something like, um, as much as it is painful, stub their toe or, 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 or jammed a finger or something like that, and, uh, and it sort of turns into a, um, you know, quite an outpouring of emotion um, that perhaps, you know, ordinarily might not have uh, might not have come out. Um, and we see our friend there, the uh, the zebra, and I guess this is potentially one of those um, existential questions. You know, chicken or the egg? Is it black stripes uh, on a white background or white stripes on a black background for a zebra? Here, clearly, the uh, artist thinks it's a black stripe. So, uh, and when things start to unravel then it's a fair chance that it's stress. <clears throat> so we have a look at what is stress, and it is, um, it's a natural um, way that the body deals with working outside our usual comfort zone. And so that is um, how we um, react uh, and adapt at times to um, certain indicators, um, certain change, and it generally comes in the form of uh, or one of two forms, and it's a, it's a hormone uh, that starts circulating throughout our body. The first one there, adrenaline. I'm sure that uh, a lot of people are familiar with. That's that um, that's that fight or flight um, 
hormone, the one that uh, really gets us to spring into action uh, when we uh, when we need to move uh, and act really quickly. Um, from a, an emergency management perspective, we usually uh, we usually associate that with um, you know impending um, disasters, rapid onset disasters. Um, in the current uh, situation, it could be you know impending floodwaters that can uh, increase. Um, um, your adrenaline, um, certainly with fires and, and, and the prospect of having to evacuate and run from a fire uh, is another one. Uh, the second one there is one we'll probably spend a little bit more time on, and that's that cortisol or the protracted stress and what happens after you've been exposed to working in a stressful situation for a lengthy period of time. Uh, and I'm sure that's one that um, a lot of people on this call will probably be able to relate to um, very well. And I know I certainly uh, did when I did this course, leaving uh, Victoria Police and coming into the Red Cross. This was something, um, and we'll talk about a checklist later, uh, that was certainly something that really resonated with me um, and made me really understand just how much stress I had been under. We'll talk briefly about adrenaline uh, just to start with, and we've got a we got a picture here of Mick Fanning and uh, the little blurry thing on the right hand side of that picture there is the shark fin of a white pointer. Um, this was uh, taken uh, a few years ago off the coast of South Africa. Uh, Mick was in a um, surfing competition uh, out there. It's all televised uh, as a lot of surfing competitions are. And uh, this shark popped up near him. Uh, he's given it a whack and swum quite literally for his life. And I think that uh, most of us would certainly have been uh, trying to move uh, as fast as we humanly possibly could to the point where it uh, would have felt like you're almost trying to walk on water. That's our fight or flight response. And um, it's that's the one where we really have to spring into action just so fast. It gives us that physical energy, that real um, that real dump of energy to be able to go and just do something extraordinary. Uh, there's, um, you know, there's stories of of women whose babies have been trapped under a car and, and they've literally, you know, lifted the car enough to be able to get the baby out. Um, very, very short term. It can't be sustained uh, for a long time, but it's certainly uh, a, a dump of energy that can be used uh, definitely to our advantage um, when we're talking about uh, a survival, um, a survival situation. <clears throat> You see that last point there where it's that shift from the language side of the brain to the image side of the brain. There's a story from the Black Saturday fires uh, down here in Victoria where there was a, a fellow from Telstra at one of the recovery centres and he's walking around uh, with pamphlets from Telstra about um, people being able to get um, mobile phones, uh, being able to get SIM cards, being able to charge their phones uh, at his desk. And uh, he's walking through the crowd Having a chat to people, and they're all in a daze uh, because of uh, because of what's going on. And he found that not too many people at all were coming up and using his services. He had, as I said, he had phones and SIM cards and chargers, and um, yeah, and the ability for them to be able to communicate with um, friends and family. He worked out though that if he just drew a picture of a phone and held it above his head, that was going to be the most effective way for him to communicate with a lot of these people, which is what he did. He put a phone, a picture of a phone above his head, and all of a sudden people are going, "Oh, phone! He can help me. You know, he can help me make a call." They weren't reading the pamphlets because they just weren't in that that right frame of mind, that position to be able to read and understand what was written in front of them. But the picture was enough to highlight what they needed, and they could uh, and they could really uh, relate to that a whole lot better. Um, but I'll just go back to Mick Fanning for a minute and uh, in a similar vein to what, you know, with people just walking around in the days, Mick gets out of the water and uh, the cameras uh, in him straight away, the reporter uh, or the commentators asking him what it felt like uh, out there with the, with the shark. His eyes are darting around. He can't concentrate on the question. He's constantly looking around for the next threat because that adrenaline is still pumping through him. He speaks in incoherent sentences. 
they just um, they just can't seem to talk to him because that adrenaline is just having such an effect on his brain uh, and on his body because he's just gone through that uh, that really high stressful um, immediate impact situation. Cortisol, on the other hand, is a lot less um, visible to us. It builds up over a long period of time. And it really is that hormone that just helps us get through um, just some of the mundane day-to-day -day activities that we know we have to keep doing, but they just seem to get harder and harder and harder. Some people liken it to walking through honey, just that really hard to pick up your feet and just keep going every day. It really does affect your memory and concentration. It makes it hard to... Um, it makes it hard to look broader than just the just the single um, uh, the single item you have in front of you, the single problem that you're trying to solve. Um, whilst it does become like, well, it says here tunneling. It's um, it's more just to really narrow the focus. That tunnel vision, um, auditory exclusion, visual exclusion, they're real signs of that uh, that adrenaline. Whereas cortisol, it's really just about becoming so single focused. Um, it, uh, it does affect the way you interact with people. Um, we've heard of stories of, say, um, yeah, say farmers. Uh, this is one from Wellington Council down here in Gippsland. Um, farmer who would pretty regularly come into the council office, uh, always chatty. Over um, over a period of time, became less chatty to the point where he just became snappy when he came into uh, when he came into have that interaction with the council staff. Was just very snappy because he just needed to get in there, get his task done, get out, and on to the next one. To start with, the council staff thought it was them that was um, that uh, you had either said something to him or, or or put him or put him off. Then it, um, after they were able to start engaging with this farmer again, it became pretty clear that the council staff who hadn't changed what they were doing were dealing with someone who was going through significant stresses. And so that enabled the council staff to be able to start to adjust the way they interacted just to try and sort of nudge that farmer into um, not so much seeking help, but certainly just trying to break down some of those uh, some of those reactions and get them to um, start to become a little bit more self-aware as to what uh, as to what was going on. Uh, and we see there it's it really does become about coping and not so much um, not so much that pleasure and, and leisure side of life. Um, we see here the, the cartoon on the side though. Um, certainly in Victoria with our uh, pretty strict lockdown that we had for some time. Um, and, you know, of course, COVID caused a lot of stress to a lot of people. Um, and as I said, particularly here in Victoria, if you forgot that you had children while they were homeschooling and you're trying to work, then um, I'd say the cortisol was really, really uh, affecting you. So, um, and I think uh, I think there's probably quite a few people that can, that can relate to that. <clears throat> so these protracted stresses, um, really do uh, become dangerous and affect how we go about our day-to-day -day lives. And it makes it very difficult to recognise when we are actually um, under the influence, I guess, of that cortisol and how it's, um, and how it's really affecting us. And we don't realise it because we're constantly working in a high-stress mode. That just becomes normal. And it reduces our self-awareness and our ability to be able to, uh, as the picture here shows, sort of look in the mirror and to sort of see um, not only ourselves, but see inside ourselves as to how we're reacting. That, um, yeah, that, that high stress mode, I referred to those two um, significant jobs uh, that I ran whilst I was in, uh, in VicPol. That first of them, that, um, that protest activity that went on for about six months, uh, that was a, um, a pretty constant period for me, uh, working sort of six days, uh, six days a week, 10 to 12 hour days, um, just dealing with um, increasingly 
the protest activity. So all of my other station management duties started slipping away. And so I was losing that focus on running the police station and just becoming singularly focused on this protest. During that time, I had to engage a lot with uh, government departments, had to engage with the um, homeless persons union. It was really almost in a state of negotiation uh, between lots of different uh, people uh, for that uh, for that six months. Um, slowly, we started to uh, be able to rehouse people because we got the Department of Health and Human Services to start uh, to start looking at some of that um, some of those solutions <clears throat> for us. Um, however. Uh, it got to the stage where the government just wanted these people out. Uh, we put together um, uh, an action uh, to be able to go and, and remove them. And uh, we gave trespass notices out, uh, which resulted in me being named in a Supreme Court injunction late on a Sunday afternoon to, uh, to stop that. Um, interestingly, the um, higher command, uh, Vic Pol command at the time, um, started to uh, have a, um, a bit of a go at the way I had been dealing it. Fortunately, I had a superintendent that um, uh, had uh, had my back at that time and, and, and basically uh, told them that you know he'd, uh, he'd been part of all that decision making as well. But that was that sort of high stress uh, that happened all the time uh, for me. And it really resulted in um, some significant dramas for my relationship at home. I wasn't spending as much time at home. Um, when I was at home, I was constantly thinking about the next move uh, in the protest activity. And so naturally enough, I wasn't spending enough um, time, wasn't paying my wife enough attention, wasn't paying my uh, then six-year-old son uh, enough attention either. So it really started breaking down some of that relationship at home. Certainly affected um, my, my fitness, and that was my way of um, coping with stress because uh, I could get out and ride my bike. Uh, I was riding to work uh, from my home to Collingwood. It was about a 30-kilometre one-way trip. Uh, but, of course, because I was working such long hours, I wasn't doing that sort of, uh, that sort of fitness activity anymore. And so that made, it, um, that made it quite difficult as the time went on to make some of those, uh, to make some of those really critical and timely decisions. Uh, and it wasn't until I was sort of pulled aside by my superintendent and, to, and forced to take a break that it uh, that it really started to assist me. But of course, I just thought, oh, well, um, you know, in policing, that's just what you do. You work uh, you work 12 hour days if you need to, 14 hours a days if you need to, uh, to get the job done. Uh, and then you're worried about uh, you're worried about your health sort of down the track. So you can see it really becomes um, uh, a, a, almost a personal battle, and it was for me, between doing the best job I could at work, but becoming so focused on work that I was uh, starting to neglect um, my family, starting to neglect my social life, which is where we get that um, where we get that recovery from, and where we can really start to um, look after ourselves. I'll move into this uh, this topic of crisis um, trajectories, and this is something that we've found through um, a lot of research into how people react uh, following a significant event. Now, this um, uh, this this event doesn't need to be a rapid onset disaster. It can be how people deal with um, long term stressors like drought, uh, like the recovery from floods, um, and no doubt. At, at times now, there may be people um, who are being, um, excuse me, potentially triggered by this current weather event. Uh, for you know, they're, they're, they're triggered again for emotions and uh, and memories from you know what happened back in 2019. But we see here that um, we've sort of got five, uh, five pretty, pretty steady groups of people that uh, that. Um, sort of react differently after a uh, after a significant event. The top two, um, uh, probably not so much in the um, you know, high in numbers, uh, high in percentages. Some people do grow from um, their uh, reaction um, to uh, adversity. Um, we know that there's people in um, uh, in the King Lake area 
uh, and the Strathewan area in Victoria, just out of Melbourne, who were significantly affected by uh, the Black Saturday fires. These people now are mentors uh, with Red Cross, uh, as well as uh, having their own um, uh, recovery consult consultancy businesses. They went through um, significant hardship after Black Saturday, uh, lost houses, um, lost friends, uh, some lost family in the fires. Uh, but they've been able to take those experiences and go out and assist people as they're uh, as they're recovering from their own significant disasters that uh, that occurred around the country. Some people just seem to be resistant. It's um, you know they just uh, they just get up, dust themselves off, and keep going like nothing had ever happened. And and I guess yeah, you, know, you might um, you might already be able to put um, some people that you know into these first two categories. The next one there, the, the resilient people, they're probably the most um, the most common. A lot of people or most people um, do experience a significant um, drop off in their resilience, a significant drop off in their own health and well-being post a significant event. But over time, and it's you know it's not it's not immediate, but it's um, you know it could be you know, a matter of weeks, months, or even years afterwards, they get back to. Uh, what Anne Ledbeater, who is one of those uh, mentors uh, I just spoke of, um, she calls it getting back to a, a, a life that is really worth living. Um, you're never going to be recovering back to exactly how things were. Um, however, you get back to you get back to that sense of really how um, how you'd really like to keep moving forward with your life. And as I said, that's probably about eighty percent of people, seventy to eighty percent of people. The bottom two there, the delayed and the chronic uh, reactions, they're the ones that uh, I guess we're most concerned with, particularly in psychosocial recovery. Uh, and this is certainly in my position as uh, chair of the planning committee here in Gippsland. We're sort of trying to put um, a bit of time into how we can assist these people and get them back up into a resilient, um, into that resilient category. So the people who have a, a chronic reaction tend to go um, down at the same rate that uh, that people who eventually become resilient um, do, but they just can't seem to see their way out. And it's just become so, um, things just um, tend to become so hopeless for them that they just can't seem to take that, you know, take that first step to really have them, uh, have them recover from um, what has happened. Uh, potentially, as uh, as the you know, rural financial councillors, you may um, you may have seen that where businesses have uh, have really um, struggled uh, through drought, and there's potentially a lot of help out there, but people just can't seem to take that take that first step, um, despite all of the um, all of the assistance that there is available. Um, I do sort of relay some stories here, and this is. Um, I should just say this is a very, very small percentage of people, uh, of course, but um, in my dealings with the supervised injecting rooms down at um, North Richmond and dealing with Department of Health and Human Services, again, um, speaking with uh, the medical staff and social workers at the facility and speaking to not only uh, some of the addicts uh, that... Um, ended up attending the facility and, and, and certainly people that we had dealings with uh, as police. Um, but speaking to the parents of some of the uh, some of the, the kids who had died, uh, I'll say kids, you know, sort of we're talking that um, 18 to 25 year old um, addicts that, that had overdosed. And there's invariably uh, just some sort of really significant traumatic event that had happened in their lives. Um, if it was girls, uh, they would have been uh, more than likely um, sexually abused uh, or assaulted uh, when they were younger. Um, boys had ended up um, being through some sort of uh, traumatic experience where they lost a parent, uh, been involved in significant car accidents, something like that. Um, one thing leads to another. They go from um, over-the-counter painkillers to prescription painkillers to illicit painkillers. And, um, and it was really... It was really quite sad listening to some of those stories, and certainly had uh, certainly had an effect on me. But that's that real chronic, uh, that real chronic reaction. There's lots of help there for them, 
but they just couldn't seem to take that next step. So um, as I said, that delayed and the chronic um, areas, that's um, only a small percentage. Resilient people, I think we find um, across the country and, and no doubt you know, most people uh, on the call here who have been working um, in, in your industries uh, for some time and working with people uh, will have seen uh, a lot of those uh, those resilient peoples and, and notice the resilience in individuals as well as communities. But you'll also notice that uh, there are people who are resistant and some who do grow from it. I presented this uh, session uh, to a little town uh, in Far East Gippsland and the people who attended um, could name some of their townsfolk um, who fit into each one of those each one of those categories. So it's certainly not um, it's certainly not an uncommon occurrence. I mentioned uh, about so some of the effects that it had on me, particularly with dealing with the um, supervising injecting rooms. Um, we see here vicarious trauma, and this uh, again is uh, important to understand as support workers and the people who are assisting um, those people who are going through significant stress. Um, and certainly, you know, this could um, not just be through your professional life, but through your, your through your family life as well. And we see here the um, reactions, the, the, the physical uh, and some mental uh, reactions, exactly the same as those six categories that we spoke about earlier on in the um, in the presentation. This is that bit where you sort of you take on what uh, what other people have gone through. And you feel somewhat at times responsible for what uh, for what had happened. And so it's a really um, so it's a, it's a it, it's really important that we understand that this can in fact happen to us. And and as I said, it, again, this happened to me, um, you know, working with that supervised injecting rooms. I was coming home. I had those stories in my head. Um, I still have some of them floating around uh, in my head they, uh, and they do surface at times, um, particularly with various news um, uh, various news reports and, and certainly at the moment um, I'm here you know I can I can certainly picture some of these people that I they spoke to um, relaying you know some of the stuff that's going on in the in the news at the moment and it's Difficult at times to uh, to suppress them. However, um, I've got to the stage where I understand where they are coming up, um, when they are coming up, and being able to um, have a look at some of those um, welfare, my own sort of welfare plan, if you like, on how to deal with it myself. But please, um, yeah, keep in keep in mind that when you are dealing with people who have uh, undergone significant stress. Um, and they do have some of those reactions that we spoke about that you can at times take them on. Uh, and that's why it's important. Again, we go back to the start, looking after yourself, your own well-being, to be able to uh, be in a position where you can make sound decisions, not only in your personal life, but um, most definitely in your business life and being able to um, being able to run your business. And on that note, um, Kerry, if you like, we might uh, we might take a break, and then um, we'll come back with uh, Eilish after uh, after this, and um, get into uh, a bit of um, Grocom's presentation uh, about um, yeah some of those um, industry and technical aspects of uh, of the, the support network. My name's Eilish. I am a Hort 360 facilitator based out of Sunny Bowen at the moment. Everyone's talking about the rain and I think it cuts off fairly well at Mackay for us. So probably we'll take a bit more of a dramatic rainfall event up here to get anything. Um, so yeah, I'm living, working in Bowen um, and been asked to give a bit of a brief presentation. And I think the key word here is brief because I don't like the sound of my own voice. So just going to go through, you know, quick tips on the for the recovery of horticulture, horticultural businesses, and also how to be prepared for one. So being based out of Bowen and the Whit Sundays, we have had probably um, two fairly big events, both of which involving rain. So we've had Tropical Cyclone Debbie, and we also had the monsoon trough come in in 2019. So at the time of the floods, I was living up in Townsville, so I got to witness firsthand how many homes went under 
and, um, you know, how devastating that was on the local community and, you know, just a township in general. Um, at the point, at that point in time, I was also working in livestock. So, you know, talk about, you know, catalytic change for people and that brought on a lot of catalytic change, I think, for graziers and how they manage their landscapes and their business structure. So backtracking before the event, I'm a big fan of Steve Comiskey and he's always drilled in, you know, the six Ps. So prior preparation prevents poor performance. And if you're a mathematician, you probably counted five, but I'll let you work out the other P in there. Um, so prior to an event, having the basics taken care of. So having insurance policies copied, scanned and at your disposal so you can quickly access them after a disaster. You know, you have itemised infrastructure and that's one of the big key things is that you have it actually itemised and probably have some sort of valuation on it. You know, it's all well and good saying that the shed was worth X amount of dollars, but when you can't prove what was in the shed, it makes things hard. Looking after yourself and having enough emergency supplies, so food, water, fuel and medicines for yourself and your family, you are the number one priority in all of this. You know, businesses can be rebuilt, sheds can be rebuilt and you can, you know, buy in topsoil, but yourself and your family are the, are the things that should not be, um, you know, <laughs> doubted upon or skimped upon. So being prepared in that sense. And having a list of emergency contacts and Grocom has actually produced the Horticultural Natural Disaster Toolkit. So taking a screenshot from the Bowen and Surrounds one and it just gives you, you know, areas to consider when preparing or putting together documents before an event. So after an event, what happens? You know, we've had just had a wave of destruction through the regions. And, you know, as you can see in the photo, that's actually just up the road from me, Donmore Farms, their shed was completely annihilated, flood inundation, and where that photo was taken is out on the main road. You can see that it's fairly low lying. Um, and yeah, that's the reason water's, water's pooling up there. Um, you know, there's other things that go in with that as well. So chemical leaks, making sure that your chemical storage facilities haven't been, you know, uh, disrupted and that there, there are no discrepancies with what was in there prior because um, that can be one of the big things. Things start to leak out to the water and you're trundling through it, you know, trying to access your property in that. Uh, damaged power lines, Ergon and Energex do a lot within those realms and you hear it every single time on the radio, you know, look up and live, watch out for fallen power lines and you can see the power lines in those photos, you know, close proximity to a metal shed. So making sure you're aware of that and, you know, that your family is aware of that and you've done a bit of reconnaissance and seeing if you actually need to call those numbers and get Ergon or Energex in to, you know, look at them. And just being patient within that process, you know, there are there will be a lot of fallen power lines and trees on power lines. So not trying to, you know, rush in there and <laughs> move things around while there are active power lines. Fuel and gas, another two big ones. Fuel potentially could leak from any sort of pipe, uh, from any sort of um, tanks that you have around the place that have had some disruption to where they're sitting and gas as well, your gas bottles. Um, just double checking those and even in cutting them off as well. Other things like road access and infrastructure, um, you know, assessing those and making sure that you know you're aware of the damage and the road access that you have and not trundling along a road at you know 100 100 kilometers an hour and you know hitting a hitting a washout um because yeah it will come unstuck for both yourself and your machinery um and making sure that you have drinking water so actually being prepared enough to have drinking water that lasts lasts from the event through the event and then probably two weeks after the event in worst case scenarios so that's really all the scary stuff and, and the immediate things that people see when they look out on their property as well. You know, taking photos for your insurance so after the event, you know, where we, we deal with a, a majority of, of growers and graziers that this event happens and they just knuckle under and they just want to get stuff done and don't realise that, you know, they, they'll need to be making an insurance claim. So actually making them stop take the time to take some photos and document things and where water was coming from and in which direction and, you know, that it was flood water and not just the, you know, the house mains that have busted. 
So just stopping, take, and it's really hard and I find that I can't do it all that well, but taking the time to stop and document these things because that's, you know, that's the next phase of going through insurance and saying what was actually damaged and broken and how badly. So this photo was actually taken from Bowen and I always kind of get a bit of a, not a laugh out of it, but, you know, you've got your your um, sand rescue boards sitting in the in the tractor. So, you know, taking photos of that. Um, and I guess the next big thing is where to from here in the Bowen Burdekin region when Cyclone Debbie went through, there was a, you know, every caps complaint was pulled out and lost and same with tomatoes. Anything that was in the ground was completely lost and, you know, $100 million worth of damage right, right there. You know, looking at the photo, you can obviously see that there's been a lot of water running through this property. It's deposited sand and silt and sediment and, and dirt you know, on top of the, the plastic that's already been put down. So growers in that instance, they've lost a crop and where to from here? Do we start trying to salvage the crop? Do we start trying to repair the shed or repair the house? Or do we just take some time to step back? And I think, you know, reflecting on what Andrew said, that when our growers are stressed, it reduces their decision-making abilities. So, you know, we talk in the livestock industry about having an, an emergency animal health plan, you know, when cattle get sick or there's an outbreak of something. And I really try and push that for growers that they have a contingency plan that includes, you know, thresholds. If my whole property has gone under and I've had damage to my sheds, what's my first priority? What's key in my business? And is it replanting and trying to get back into the market? Or is it, you know, putting in a shed because I might be able to actually, you know, rent out the shed to my neighbours who have decided to plant because they're not going to be there and, you know, building back in time. So there's a wave of decisions and I think it's about having a strategic plan for dealing with that. Otherwise, you know, as you said, Andrew, cortisol builds up, you start to make poor decisions, you start not to sleep and the grey matter in your brain doesn't doesn't clear out and you're more, I guess, at risk of making rash decisions that don't pay dividends in the long run. Um consider food safety and disease control after an event and I think this is really paramount in the horticultural industry in that we have you know growers who have built 30 40 50 years plus um, you know reputations for delivering fresh quality produce and all of a sudden that's that's being put at risk and put in jeopardy um, because of this you know disaster that's gone through so walking through the steps, taking some soil tests and understanding what contaminants you have. And that also goes back to your gas pipeline or, you know, your petrol or chemical storage might be fine, but you've just been inundated with water from other people's properties and you don't know what's in there. So taking a step back, getting some soil tests done and making sure that you're actually right to plant and right to grow within that uh, within that soil biome. And I think that's really key and essential because you don't want to go through, put in a lot of money to get plants back up and going or planting new crops in and then realising, oh, no, there was actually, you know, organic chlorides in the in the soil or there was, you know, something horrendous in there and now everything that I've grown for this year has just been rejected from the market but I'm still, you know, having to pay for the labour, for the inputs, for the machinery. So... The next point in that is if you do continue to grow the wash water slash post harvest post harvest treatment of your crops. So we see this a lot of time. Like you know, prime example of this would be melon industry that you know it it becomes hard to wash off mud off off crops and that can lead to certain bacteria developing. So looking at the water that you're using, you know, is it from a ground source that may have been affected, you know, by a large volume of water? Is it of the, the highest quality or is it, you know, that there's, you know, something dead is washed up in your in your dam and you need to be very, very cautious of that because you are dealing with workplace health and safety and, you know, consumers as well and consumers. Um, contact with off-farm water. So, you know, there's a large volumes of water going through and it might not be you but your neighbours that have something that is not conducive to a good growing environment and you need to be aware, aware of that. Um, 
disease entry points, pest control, and also remaining vigilant when borrowing or loaning machinery. So recently had Callum Fletcher come up from Ausveg and he talks a lot about on-farm biosecurity and risk pathways and where these diseases come from and, you know, like post an event, everyone is scrambling for machinery to come through and, you know, clear up certain areas. Like we saw in the other photo on the previous slide that there, that, that, plaster that plastic needs to be pulled up and if your machinery has been damaged then you're probably likely going to be borrowing somebody else's or hiring it from somewhere but you need to remain vigilant that that machinery hasn't been on your property and may actually contain pests weeds and diseases that are going to put you in at a disadvantage in the long run you know we have rubber vine we have cucumber green model mosaic and you know all of those that so seeds and, and soil pathogens that you don't want to be bringing onto your farm. So just being really conscious of that, you know, uh, pest control as well. And looking at the photo, we've got Ben Martin here and he's, you know, gone out to assess his mango trees and you can clearly see that branches have been snapped. And I think the stresses on those trees really puts them at a disadvantage to be fighting off anything that, you know, is a virus or a fungus. So cleaning up trees and making sure that, you know, those path of your, your trees or crops, uh, you reduce their stress levels and you reduce points of access for, you know, diseases to, to infiltrate because, you know, we're talking trees in this instance, and that's a long-term crop. You know, it takes three or four years to get it up to a fruiting stage. And, you know, the longevity of that you really need to ensure. So making those decisions about when to, you know, potentially cut your losses and prune hard for the next season and reduce that loss, uh, reduce the amount of fruit produced for the next season. But long-term, those trees will be better performing. Um, impacts on productivity continuing it I guess we see a lot of this uh you know soil erosion and with floods and heavy rains uh like the leaching of nutrients especially nitrogen through the soil so that photo was actually taken from Gatton and I think it's really reflective that obviously you can see that there's a a green grassy headland over there um and then on the in the actual cropping area you know it's been washed away until that compacted zone and um, talking about when Debbie happened, the ground compaction was so severe that um, that they were just thankful that the, there was follow-up rain to, you know, take some of that that uh, compactedness out of the soil because the rain during Cyclone Debbie had been that, that hard that it had actually hardened the ground to pretty much cement. So once again, soil testing, I think, is paramount. You've either lost topsoil or you've gained new topsoil from somewhere else, you know, depending on where you are in the catchment and pre-existing management of that probably isn't going to cut it because it's changed so much. So having a look at that, and I think the other thing is within those systems, you've, you've waterlogged the soil and soil microbiology is going to be fairly low, you know, you know, biology needs that those carbon and oxygen pockets to breathe, and we pretty much just waterlog log them for potentially upwards of two weeks, depending on how quickly your um, soil drains. So, looking at your soil, and I, you know, that's pretty much where you're going to be planting to into. So, is it worth it actually planting into this soil, or is it worth just giving it a miss, focusing your attentions elsewhere because another pocket of land hasn't been so badly impacted? And, yeah, you know, that, that photo really shows that everything on that topsoil has been taken off and it's down to that compacted level and what are the outcomes of growing within that soil. Um, yeah, one of the fundamentals of, I guess, Hort 360 is preventing erosion and your, the soil is your farm's greatest a asset, particularly that first six inches of topsoil um, and minimising that is always a positive and, you know, up in Bowen, you know, we have people who put in cover crops because they want those living root systems in the soil or cover crops in. Um, they ensure those buffer zones are there because if we get a cyclone roll through, they want something that protects the soil from that wind erosion and that rainfall erosion. So it's a fairly common practice. And, I mean, that can be just as simple as going to your local elders or nutrient and saying, I want the cheapest bag of, you know, forage that you have. But at least you've got something within the within the soil that protects it and, you know, protects it from that rainfall and windfall, wind erosion. 
The other two big things are control structures and management management and maintenance of those. So if you, you know, you'd know yourself, your growers would know themselves, low parts of their farm or, you know, soils that are really sort of uh, conducive to erosion, they know within their property where those are and putting in some control structures and maintenance on those. So after the monsoon went through, uh, Malongal Creek, which is just uh, near Gumlu, completely it was just it was high volumes of water channeling water blowing through and we had a lot of stream bank erosion within those had people put in control structures so actually had stream bank erosion like measures put in so rock armoring pylons being dr driven down and it's part of their farm plan now that every season they go out and check that and you know the management and maintenance of that was finding some cheap forage to put in there to create some root structure just to stabilize the bank and every season or every rainfall event, they go out and check it because that's integral to their that's integral to their business and their property. So if the stream, if Mongol Creek had a burst, it would have just ripped straight through their property and pretty much divided it in two. So for them, that's that's just something that's a cost that they're willing to wear, and they you know push a bit of irrigation over it just to keep that forage alive in preparation for the next event. And I think that's probably like that's part of their farm structure now and it's probably the best outcomes for them. So, you know, we've had reaching out is probably the next big part and I think growers within these systems, you know, need to take stock a what they have at the time and actually reach out and understand their current market position. You know, some of these people have already pre-sold or pre like have contracts with Coles and Woolworths and will need to apply for variations either in size or quality um, of fruit and vegetables produced. So having those conversations early with your market agent um, and actually just giving a very realistic sort of snapshot in time that this is where I am I've taken stock of my soils, the infrastructure damage and everything else that's happened on my property and this is where I'm going to be for the next year because if you can't, you know, produce to a certain tonnage or to a certain quality, you need to be putting in variations and I'm hopeful that Coles and Woolworths are very understanding of the situations that people were in after Cyclone Debbie, like we lost every single capsicum plant you know, and we've lost we've lost a lot of we lost a lot of tomatoes as well, even though there were later plantings that were going to be happening, and our soil was so depleted of nitrogen because everything had been leached. You know, quality wasn't going to be there for for the next year. And those who took the time to talk to their market agent or talk to their contractors were in a better position. Um, the other thing within that is to talk to a banker, loaner, or accountant, or you know, rural financial counselling, and that about what this means for your position moving forward and I mean it might be in one year one year's time you want to be you know 90 percent operational or in 10 years time that you know you think you're going to have paid back the the new shed that you're going to have to put in and that's the end for me well, Eilish thank you very much um uh and Andrew I'll just hand back to you for the next session thanks Thanks, Karen. Thanks. I always yeah, just said at the uh, at the start, I really looked uh, forward to that session, and I, uh, I find it quite uh, I find it quite interesting. Uh, not being um, part of, I guess, the uh, the horticultural industry um, myself, but uh, but certainly listening to to what goes on um, and how to manage, um, particularly post uh, a significant event like a, a cyclone of those mon by those monsoon events is uh, is great to hear. Um, and and obviously what we uh, what we did see there, particularly with some of that, um, you know, the consequences of uh, what can happen after um, a significant event. Um, it's really important that um, you know people are in the position to be able to make some pretty um, clear and decisive decisions, um, especially uh, in the days and weeks after those sorts of events that. Um, I made the I made the comment there about uh, don't know how much the max tracks were going to be uh, of use to get that tractor out of the bog there, but um, uh, and being an avid four wheel driver, I know what uh, I know what max tracks can do and, and potentially what they can't do, <clears throat> uh, and water rescue is not one of them. Um, but likewise, you know, even that uh, even the shed that uh, was half blown over, 
you know, power lines everywhere, uh, potential chemical leaks uh, just with whatever, um, you know, whatever chemicals you're using on the farms and that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, really need to uh, be in that position to make those those really good decisions. <clears throat> and that's where um, looking after yourself and being able to recognise those signs of stress can really uh, be of some assistance. Um, before we move into um, some of those techniques, um, we'll just sort of talk about very briefly what well-being is. Uh, and you might have to excuse my dog barking in the background if you can hear that because my wife's just got home. Um, well-being is a state of complete mental and social well-being. So we see that um, the Venn diagram there, and we really need to have all three of those aspects um, interlinking. And the closer we can get them to line up, the better sense of well-being that we'll have. So it's not really just uh, not about being sick. Um, it's really looking after ourselves uh, from our mental health capacity, uh, from our physical capacity, and um, very importantly, our social capacity, and making sure that we can, uh, yeah, that we are interacting uh, with others uh, when we need, and we can you know, can really interact um, in a meaningful and positive way. <coughs> um, I'll very briefly touch on this one because I know that uh, we are sort of uh, starting to get a little short on time, but uh, and I want to make sure that we get away uh, even a little bit earlier if we can. Um, this question here, are you a martyr, robot or a professional? Um, there's a lady by the name of uh, Dr. Kate Brady. Uh, she's, a, um, uh, I suppose, an expert on recovery, um, has studied it uh, quite significantly since uh, Black Saturday. Uh, she works for the Red Cross as one of our um, uh, recovery um, advisors uh, at a national level. She worked. Uh, she turned up to a recovery centre at Black Saturday and was asked by the recovery manager whether or not um, she was a martyr or was she a robot. And she didn't quite. Uh, Kate didn't quite understand what that meant. And so the recovery. Um, coordinator at this relief centre explained that, well, if you're a martyr, you're going to be of really great value right now. I can use you for about maybe three months tops, uh, but you'll be burnt out. Um, you'll go through, you'll achieve a lot of things, but you'll just work so hard that after three months uh, you'll be cooked and there's not really any point in investing any time into you. The other side of that, though, is that um, if you're going to be a robot, I'm not really going to get any results from you right now. However, I can invest in you and we can get uh, start seeing some value from you in you know, 12 to 12 to 15 months time. Has anyone got feedback coming through now? Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm getting a little bit of feedback. Oh. Can everyone go on mute except Ricky? So. <clears throat> yeah. uh. Close enough. Look, I'll, I'll, I'll keep punching through. And a robot is someone who's going to uh, is going to do the job methodically and very thoroughly, but not be able to achieve results straight away. And so this is where Kate sort of come up with this uh, this idea of that you know at times you have to be a martyr. Some at times you have to be able to make decisions quickly and do things um, in a very short space of time and be able to achieve some results, but certainly be able to look after yourself enough so that you can plan for those events that are 12, 18 months down the track. Um, for instance, we're in um, the recovery phase after the fires of 2019-2020. Uh, uh, we're into our second year of recovery now. We've already seen that uh, with some of the recovery agencies, some people have worked flat out and they're really starting to, uh, really starting to struggle now uh, in some of the other uh, agencies because they've just gone Health for leather in their communities, really good. They've uh, they've started off uh, the recovery really well, but now they're starting to move into that phase where you know it's it's dawned on them that you know we're still going to be doing recovery for um, the next three potentially five years. So they need to uh, you need to be able to look after yourself and become that professional, achieve those quick results when you need to. Uh, but by the same token, start planning, looking after your own welfare so that you can uh, be in a position to still be working at a really good level further down the track. <clears throat> uh, there we go. Uh, becoming aware of our stress levels. Um, this burnout checklist uh, comes from a publication by the New Zealand Red Cross, and it's a, um, it's a, a checklist that certainly when I went through it, uh, back 
uh, when I started with Red Cross, I started ticking a lot of these boxes and found that um, perhaps the work that I'd been doing in VicPol had really started to affect me and really um, started to um, make me realise that I'd um, that I'd really been um, struggling a fair bit with the stress. Shut the door, please. <clears throat> Uh, it's, so I've just lost my train of thought for a minute. Um, so when um, uh, so when you start having a look at this list and you start ticking off, yeah, I've experienced a loss of capacity for empathy. Um, you know, I'm starting to get overwhelmed by the size of the task, and, and certainly in recovery, that can be a big thing. You know, starting to become um, feel that feeling of ch being challenged by change. Um, and you know the the old well this is all how we've always done it is um, it probably doesn't really cut it uh, these days. <clears throat> it's um, it you know that, in, that it's really time to start uh, having a look at your own well-being. And this is where uh, and it's an article written by uh, a sports psychologist by the name of Andrew May, uh, and I'll be able to share these uh, via Kerry. Um, uh, Post this uh, post this session, and Andrew May was a, a professional athlete. Uh, started doing some work on um, sports psychology and how athletes recover, um, and particularly high performing athletes and how they can stay at the top of their game for quite a significant amount of time. And he's come up with the idea of this recovery rocket, and has even taken it into the um, the business world and looking at how um, high performing um, businesses and their CEOs uh, do recovery. He thought, well, why is it that we've got um, CEOs who are in charge of significant um, multinational companies um, are getting by on only four hours sleep a night? Are they making the right decisions? Whereas a, a high performing athlete who needs to be at the top of their game uh, as well has a proper recovery um, regime built into their daily routine. So he's come up with this uh, recovery rocket with that bottom one, and if I liken it to a AFL slash NRL uh, type season, that off season is that uh, that break, that good break that uh, players have from uh, the clubs post uh, the grand final. So it might be um, eight weeks, might be 10 weeks, depending on how uh, your team went in the finals. But that's a really good break where they are away from the club, they're away from everything. Um, in um, our cases, it might be having that two or three week holiday where you can switch the phone off and just really be um, away from work. The next one there is that um, mini break, and that's having three mini breaks during the year. And so that's um, yeah, taking a long weekend. Uh, again, if we liken it to uh, to the sports seasons, um, and certainly with the AFL, they'll have a, um, a short pre-season competition after they've started training again. Then they'll have a week off before the season proper starts. Um, in the middle of the season, now they have uh, each of the teams have a uh, have another week off. And then again, prior to the finals starting, there's another break for those uh, eight teams that are in the finals. So they have these uh, these little mini breaks where they can get away from the club again, um, switch off, and really start to. Um, regenerate, um, recover not only from their injuries, but also recover from the mental stress that occurs um, at that high performing sports level. The uh, the middle section there, recovery points, 30 recovery points, I'll, uh, I'll speak a bit more about shortly because we have a slide uh, specific for that one. The next one up, 300 uh, nights of proper sleep. Uh, again, Difficult to uh, difficult to really determine what um, a proper night's sleep is for everyone. Um, the average, scientifically, they say, is sort of between seven to eight hours uh, of sleep a night. Um, that may not be possible uh, because of you know whatever time of year it is um, on the land, um, uh, whether it's agriculture and they're um, you know they're up to lambing season or calving season or um, or, you know, something something to do with uh, with the animals. You have to be up uh, a bit later. Uh, it might be in horticulture. It could be um, you know, cropping time, seeding time, whatnot. Um, but getting that proper sleep to really help your brain switch off uh, and really start to um, relax your body to be able to uh, have 
that uh, that really good slope and regenerate again both physically and mentally is very important. The one that is probably most achievable um, and that's every day is taking uh, about five or ten minutes of uh, what he calls slow time and that's just that time where you can sit down uh, on your own not have any electronics um, so no phone iPad laptop uh, TV and just be uh, almost well not almost at one with yourself you just need to be um, in the moment and that's about just sitting there, you could call it meditation, you could call it uh, mindfulness, but it's really just taking that time for yourself just to really slow things down, uh, let thoughts come and go and just really uh, concentrate on doing nothing and just really taking that time just to settle everything down. Um, I certainly do that. I do that before I go to bed because uh, I've found that it does, in fact, help me sleep. So rather than taking the iPad to bed and having a look, I'll um, read a book for a bit and then just switch everything off. Um, so I'm not having to you know, worry about looking at anything. The brain's not working. It's just uh, letting thoughts come and go. I spoke about that uh, well-being points uh, very quickly uh, just before. So the well-being points is where you have 30 weeks where you try to get uh, build up 100 points. And that is uh, through certain activities, which are, I suppose, uh, relaxation activities, um, things that um, you can either do by yourself or uh, with others, um, but just making sure that it's away from work, um, you're able to switch off from your normal day-to-day -day activities and just really start looking after yourself. Um, naturally enough, things like massage, meditation, uh, some yoga, they're um, quite um, high in the points um, section. Um, TV, probably not, although a lot of people do find TV relaxing because you can just switch off and uh, not have to concentrate about uh, about what's going on on the screen too much. Um, personally, I don't mind having a hit of golf and, and going uh, fishing because you know, I live in a pretty good part down here where I can uh, where I can do those things. Um, probably much like uh, some of you up there, um, particularly along the coast, you might be able to do that. Might be a bit more difficult further out, uh, but I'm sure that there's other uh, there's other activities on here uh, that you'd be able to do. And again, this is just about spending that time away from work and being able to just uh, relax. Um, that 365 days of slow time. Um, uh, I haven't been able to embed a YouTube video in here that does go for 10 minutes, but uh, again, I'll send the link uh, with um, with some other documentation. Andy Puddicombe is the founder of Headspace in England, uh, and some of you may be familiar with, um, with the Headspace uh, app uh, of the company over there. He talks about uh, mindfulness and being able to spend that 10 minutes uh, just to yourself. Uh, and as I said, really letting those um, thoughts just come and go and become, you know, in the moment. Uh, although, as our friend here says, unless it's unpleasant, then you're going to have a cookie. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, because of the lockdowns here in Victoria, I probably had too many more cookies than what uh, I should have. Uh, maybe not uh, due to mindfulness, but just because we couldn't get out and do too much exercise. Workplace wellbeing, we've spoken about sort of how it, um, how we can look after ourselves individually, um, how we can recognise those signs in ourselves. It's important as um, managers and people who are dealing with uh, people often uh, that we can recognise those signs in others. And it's important that we do acknowledge the impacts that stresses can have uh, on everyone. <clears throat> and it's going to affect people differently as, we, uh, as we've spoken about. It's important also that as uh, as managers and leaders uh, within our own organisations that we're talking about psychological welfare, we're talking about mental health um, as though uh, it's an everyday occurrence, which it is. We want to make sure that it becomes common language uh, when we talk about mental health, looking after ourselves, looking after our well-being. Uh, most uh, workplace agendas and certainly uh, all of the uh, workplace agendas that I've been to and in fact even going into 
um, incident management teams uh, when we're running uh, emergencies and managing emergency situations, we talk about safety and a lot of that is about physical safety. And that is yeah, making sure we're not getting injured at work, physically injured at work. Uh, what we want to do now is try and build that uh, mental health component, that mental health safety into our work agendas. Start talking about it and making it one of the first things that you do talk about in your agendas. We know that if people are looking after their own well-being, if staff well-being uh, is high on a um, on a manager's uh, list of priorities, then everything else will start to fall in place behind it because we've got staff who are um, happy at work, they're happy in their own lives, they're happy in themselves, and they can function at a much higher level. And we know that uh, that's going to be more productive uh, for the organisation, but it's certainly going to be so much better for people, particularly when they do face adversity, because then they've already got uh, quite a high resilience uh, to what can happen. We'll wrap it up. Uh, probably really quickly now and there's um, there's just sort of four questions that uh, I'd like you to have a think about and uh, feel free to add some um, comments in the chat here if you like but um, these four questions is just hopefully uh, something has um, resonated with you today um, hopefully there has been something that um, has triggered something um, for your own actions something you're going to start doing for your own well-being potentially something that you stop or might stop doing for your own well-being um, and i particularly like that last question i reflect on this quite often is something that um, you know i can do to share with other supporters or other people in my organization uh, and i certainly take this to some of the external meetings uh, that i go to is how can i how can I take something that I've learnt or something that has worked for me and start sharing that with other people from other organisations? And certainly um, me coming and talking to today is, is, is something that I enjoy doing. Um, it's certainly something that helps, uh, helps me um, keep working through uh, some of those um, yeah, some of those situations that I have uh, previously been in. And of, of course, I mentioned that, um, you know, some of those some of those thoughts that keep uh, bouncing back from you know, uh, a little while ago. So um, again, thanks for uh, thanks for listening. I will throw back to uh, Kerry very shortly after I do just a little bit of um, <clears throat> shameless promotion. Uh, Red Cross do have um, several other uh, different courses. Uh, I don't know Jess and Linda. Uh, sorry, not Linda, Sandy, um, who are on the session today. Both Red Cross trainers. Um, they'll be able to assist with some of this, um, these training sessions uh, that are on the screen now. Uh, by all means, contact Dave Brown, uh, your direct uh, resilience coordinator up there in Queensland, because Dave's uh, excellent. He's um, he's very knowledgeable in all of uh, all of the work that Red Cross has been doing, uh, and I certainly do take a good lead from Dave, uh, particularly some of the work that we're doing here in Victoria. And on that note, I will attempt to change screens like that and throw back to you Kerry. Andrew thank you so much it's so valuable hearing your personal experiences um, this particular uh, program is designed for primary producers especially those farmers that were impacted by the monsoon trough flood but you know we're all all humans and we all have the same issues we all need to learn discernment of other people's emotions and feelings and our interactions with them. And just really, really appreciate you sharing those personal insights and how we can actually work better and be better equipped in this recovery space. Each of us bring our own personality and our own situations for the day to various um, meetings and engagements with farmers and I think it's important that you know we know how to use discernment and how to use these sorts of skills that you've presented today to help us but also to help our customers our clients our members um, farmers so on that note thank you Andrew um, we just want to give a plug to the industry support network that we have started to develop um, each of you now having joined this are now unofficially 
on our support network and um, you're already working in that space. So we thank each and every one of you for working with farmers and helping them through these difficult times. But we have on the Farmer Disaster Support website that QFF manages an industry support network and you can sign up to that and we'll share that link with you. Andrew, if you just want to flick to the next slide, we'll talk about QFF. Just a little bit of benefit for the QFF members. The member groups are the uh, grower groups and also a lot of the irrigator groups. Um, you can, uh, there's some, some member benefits for belonging to QFF. Um, we've got a special deal with Bunnings to promote their power pass so you can get extra discounts. There's autotender.com.au where farmers and primary producers can obtain special um, offers. Same with national salary packaging and safe ag systems. So we certainly work with some key providers within the um, allied trades and support network for farmers. So we're working with them um, to bring benefits to the primary production sector. Uh, you can also sign up if you're not already signing up to the top 10. Andrew, on the next slide, you can have a look at the QR code and um, we send out an email each Monday morning about the top 10 things that are important to primary producers. Um, so feel free to either register for that there using the QR code or online at qff.org.au. Um, we, we'll wrap it up there. Um, we'll make this session available. So we'll send you a link to this, this um, webinar presentation. And um, if there's any Final questions, I might just open it up. Please use the chat or if you want to raise your hand and um, have a chat to Andrew or myself or indeed Dave or Eilish. We'll just give a moment for you to indicate that. Kerry, if I could just um, say a few words. Um, you know, thank you, Kerry, for hosting these workshops. It, it's been really good to, to partner with Queensland Farmers Federation to link with industry and connect wellbeing and self-care with the on-ground farm practicalities of recovering from a disaster. Uh, thank you, Bricky, for sharing your extensive knowledge and, and experience and uh, delivering the material for these workshops. And uh, great to see um, a lot of people online from a range of different organisations and uh, different areas of Queensland. And um, I hope that uh, this has resonated with you. Um, yeah, thank you for your particip participation this evening. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Dave. Uh, it's Brian Dodson. Look, I'd just like to congratulate you on the presentations, guys. I think it was uh, exceptionally uh, important for rural financial councillors to uh, um, adhere to uh, some of the suggestions that came out and uh, yeah, well done. Thanks, Brian. Well, Thanks, we certainly um, appreciate everyone coming along today. Ricky, any final comment? Oh, I was just going to say thanks, Brian. And yeah, we'll get those, uh, um, yeah, that other material, uh, particularly that Andrew May article is a really good one. Uh, it's only a couple of pages long, so um, yeah, it doesn't take uh, it doesn't take too long to read, and um, certainly really, really good. Um, but yeah, and if there's any questions, uh, please reach out to either myself or Dave. Um, and of course, we've got uh, you know, Jason Sandy up there um, as Red Cross trainers as well. So I look forward to working with him. That's fantastic. Eilish, thank you very much for your presentation. Really appreciate it. And uh, to the others from Growcom, Lena and uh, Jamie, thank you very much for joining us today. I think there's still a lot of work to do for us all. Um, but I think if we can get through it together, um, I think we'll all be stronger as a unit and also be able to help our customers, farmers um, and everyone who's in rural and regional communities. So thank you very much for joining. We'll sign off today. If anyone's got any questions, just flick us an email or um, yeah, happy to chat anytime. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was very interesting.